Chapter Nineteen of an American Politician. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bob Sage. An American Politician by F. Marion Crawford. Chapter Nineteen. A change has come over Boston in four months since John Harrington and Josephine Thorne parted. The breath of the spring has been everywhere, and the haze of the hot summer is ripening the buds that the spring has brought out. The trees on the common are thick and heavy with foliage, the public garden is a carpet of bright flowers, and on the walls of Beacon Street the great creepers have burst into blossom and are stretching long shoots over the brown stone and the iron balconies. There is a smell of violets and flowers in the warm air, and down on the little pond the swan-shaped boats are paddling about with their cargoes of merry children and calico nursery maids, while Irish boys look on from the banks and throw pebbles when the policemen are not looking, wishing they had the spare coin necessary to embark for a ten minutes' voyage on the mimic sea. Unfamiliar figures wander through the streets of the West End, and more than half of the houses show by the boarded windows and doors that the owners are out of town. The migration of tax-dodgers took place on the last day of April. They will return on the second day of December, having spent just six months and one day in their country places whereby they have shifted the paying of a large proportion of their taxes to more economical regions. It is a very equitable arrangement, for it is only the rich man who can save money in this way, while his poorer neighbor, who has no country seat to which he may escape, must pay to the uttermost farthing. The system stimulates the impecunious to become wealthy, and helps the rich to become richer. It is, therefore, perfectly good and just. But Boston is more beautiful in the absence of the tax-dodger than at any other season. There is a stillness and a peace over the fair city that one may long for in vain during the winter. Business, indeed, goes on without interruption, but the habitation of the great men of business knows them not. They come up from their cool bowers by the sea in special trains, in steamers, and in yachts every morning, and early in the afternoon they go back, so that all day long the broad streets at the west are quiet and deserted and seem to be basking in the sunshine to recover from the combined strain of the bitter winter and the unceasing gaiety that accompanies it. In the warm June weather, Miss Schenectady and Joe still linger in town. The old lady has no new-fangled notions about taxes, and though she is rich and has a pretty place near Newport, she will not go there until she is ready. No, not for all the tax-gatherers in Massachusetts. As for Joe, she does not want to go away. Urgent letters come by every mail entreating her to return to England in time for a taste of the season in London. But they lie unanswered on her table, and often she does not read more than half of what they contain. The books and the letters accumulate in her room, and she takes no thought whether she reads them or not, for the time is weary on her hands, and she only wishes it gone by, no matter how. Nevertheless, she will not go home, and she even begs her aunt not to leave Boston yet. She is paler than she was, and her face looks thin. She says she is well, and as strong as ever, but the elasticity has gone from her step, and the light has faded in her brown eyes, so that one might meet her in the street and hardly know her. As she sits by the window, behind the closed blinds, the softened light falls on her face, and it is sad and weary. It was not until John Harrington was gone that she realized all. He had received the message he expected early on the morning after that memorable parting, and before midday he was on his way. 
Since then she had heard no word of tidings concerning him, save that she knew he had arrived in England. For anything she knew, he might even now be in America again, but she would not believe it. If he had come back, he would surely have come to see her, she thought. There were times when she would have given all the world to look on his face again, but for the most part she said to herself it was far better that she should never see him. Where was the use? Joe was not of the women who have intimate confidants and can get rid of much sorrow by much talking about it. She was too proud and too strong to ask for help or sympathy in any real distress. She had gone to Sybil Brandon when she was about to tell Ronald of her decision, because she thought that Sybil would be kind to him and help him forget the past. But where she herself was alone concerned, she would rather have died many deaths than confess what was in her heart. She had gone bravely through the remainder of the season until it was all over, and no one had guessed her disappointment. Such perfect physical strength as hers was not to be broken down by the effort of a few weeks, and still she smiled and talked and danced and kept her secret. But as the long months crawled out their tale of dreary days, the passion in her soul spread out great roots and grew fiercely against the will that strove to break it down. It was a love against which there was no appeal, which had taken possession silently and stealthily with no outward show of wooing or sweet words. And then, safe within the fortress of her maidenly soul, it had grown up to a towering strength, feeding upon her whole life and ruthlessly dealing with her as it would. But this love sought no confidence, nor help, nor assistance, being of itself utterly without hope, strong and despairing. One satisfaction only she had daily. She rejoiced that she had broken away from the old ties, from Ronald and from her English life, to have found herself positively loving one man while she was betrothed to another would have driven her to terrible extremity. The mere idea of going back to her mother and to the old life at home with this wild thought forever gnawing at her heart was intolerable. She might bear it to the end, whatever the end might be, and in silence, so long as none of her former associations made the contrast between past and present too strong. Old Miss Schenectady, with her books and her odd conversation, was as good a companion as any one, since she could not live alone. Sybil Brandon would have wearied her by her sympathy, gentle and loving as it would have been, and besides, Sybil was away from Boston and very happy. It would be unkind, as well as foolish, to disturb her serenity with useless confidences. And so the days went by, and the hot summer was come, and yet Joe lingered in Boston, suffering silently and sometimes wondering how it would all end. Sybil was staying near Newport with her only surviving relation, an uncle of her mother. He was an old man, upward of eighty years of age, and he lived in a strange old place six or seven miles from the town. But Ronald had been there more than once and he was always enthusiastic in his description of what he had seen, and he seemed particularly anxious that Joe should know how very happy Sybil was in her country surroundings. Ronald had traveled during the spring, making short journeys in every direction, and constantly talking of going out to see the West, a feat which he never accomplished. He would go away for a week at a time, and then suddenly appear again, and at last had gravitated to Newport. Thence he came to town occasionally and visited Joe, never remaining more than a day, and sometimes only a few hours. Joe was indifferent to his comings and goings, but always welcomed him in a friendly way. She saw that he was amusing himself, and was more glad than ever that the relations formerly existing between them had so opportunely broken off. He had never referred to the past since the final interview when Joe had answered him by bursting into tears, and he talked about the present cheerfully enough. 
One morning he arrived without warning, as usual, to make one of his short visits. Joe was sitting by the window, dressed all in white, and the uniform absence of color in her dress rather exaggerated the pallor of her face than masked it. She was reading, apparently with some interest, in a book of which the dark-lined binding sufficiently declared the sober contents. As she read, her brows bent in the effort of understanding while the warm breeze that blew through the blinds fanned her tired face and gently stirred the small, stray ringlets of her soft brown hair. Ronald opened the door and entered. "'Oh, Ronald!' exclaimed Joe, starting a little nervously. "'Have you come up? You look like the sunshine. Come in and shut the door.' He did as he was bidden, and came and sat beside her. "'Yes, I have come up for the day. Uh, how are you, Joe, dear? You look pale. It is this beastly heat. You ought to come down to Newport for a month. It is utterly idiotic, you know, staying in town in this weather.' "'I like it,' said Joe. "'I like the heat so much that I think I should be cold in Newport.' tell me all about what you have been doing. Oh, I hardly know, said Ronald, lots of things. Tell me what you do in one day. Yesterday, for instance. I want to be amused this morning. It is not so very amusing, you know, but it is very jolly, answered Ronald. To begin with, I get up at unholy hours and go and bathe in the surf at the second beach. There are no end of a lot of people there, even at that hour. Yes, I dare say. And then? Oh, then I go home and dress, and later, if I do not ride, I go to the club, casino, I beg your pardon, and play tennis. They play very decently, some of those fellows. Are there any nice rides? Just along the roads, you know, but uh, when you get out to Sherwood there are meadows and things, with a brook that is very fair. Do you still go to Sherwood often? How is Sybil? Yes, said Ronald, and a blush rose quickly to his face. I often go there. It is such a queer old place, you know, full of trees and old summer houses and graveyards. Awfully funny. Tell me, Ronald, said Joe, insisting a little, how is Sybil? She looks very well. I suppose she is. But she never goes to anything in Newport. She has not been in the town at all yet since she went to stay with her uncle. But, of course, lots of people go out to see her, do they not? No, well, not many. In fact, I do not remember having met anyone there, answered Ronald, as though he were trying to recall some face besides Miss Brandon's. Her uncle is such an odd bird, you have no idea. I do not imagine you see very much of him when you go there, said Joe, with a faint laugh. Oh, I always see him, of course, said Ronald, blushing again. He is about a hundred years old, and wears all kinds of clothes and wanders about the garden perpetually, but I do not talk to him unless I am driven to it. Which does not occur often, interrupted Joe. No, well, I suppose not very often. Why should it? Ronald was visibly embarrassed. Joe watched him with a look of amusement on her face, but affectionately, too, as though what he said pleased her as well as amused her. There was a short pause, during which Ronald rubbed his hat slowly and gently. Then he looked up suddenly and met Joe's eyes. But he turned away again instantly, blushing redder than ever. Ronald, Joe said presently, I am so glad glad? Why? And about what? I am glad that you like her, and that she likes you. I think you like her very much, Ronald. Oh, yes, very much, repeated Ronald, trying to seem indifferent. Do you not feel as though you were much more like brother and sister now? asked Joe, after a little while. Oh, much. I suppose it is better, too, though I did not think so at first. It is far better, said Joe, laying her small thin hand across her cousin's strong fingers, and pressing them a little. 
you are free now, and you will probably be very happy before long. Do you not think so? She asked, looking affectionately into his eyes. I hope so, said Ronald, with a last attempt at indifference. Then suddenly his face softened, and he added in a gentler tone, Indeed, Joe, I, I think I shall be very happy soon. I am so glad, said Joe again, still holding his hand, but leaning her head back wearily on the deep chair. There is only one thing that troubles me. What is that? That horrid will, said Joe. I am sure we could get it altered in some way. We never thought about it before, Joe. Why should we think about it now? It seems to me it is a very good will, as things have turned out. But, my dear boy, said Joe, if you are married to Sybil Brandon, you will need ever so much money. Ronald blushed again. I have not asked her to marry me, he said quickly. That makes no difference at all, replied Joe. As I was saying, when you have married her, you will need money. What an idea! exclaimed Ronald indignantly, as if any one wanted to be rich in order to be happy. Besides, between what I have of my own and my share of the money, there is nearly four thousand a year, and then there is the place in Lanarkshire for us to live in, as if that were not enough. It is not very much, though, said Joe, reflecting. I do not think Sybil has anything at all. You will be as poor as two little church mice. But I will come and stay with you sometimes, Joe added, laughing, and help you about the bills. The bills would take care of themselves, said Ronald gravely. They always do. But whatever happens, Joe, my home is always yours. You will always remember that, will you not? Dear Ronald, answered his cousin affectionately, you are as good as it is possible to be. You really are. Ronald, said Joe, after a pause, I have an idea. He looked at her inquiringly, but said nothing. I might, she continued, smiling at the thought. I may go and marry first, you know, after all, and spoil it. But you will not, will you? Promise me you will not. I wish I could, said Joe, and then you could have the money. But I would not let you, interrupted Ronald. I would go off and get married by license and that sort of thing. Without asking Miss Brandon, suggested Joe. Nonsense, ejaculated Ronald, coloring for the twentieth time. I think we are talking nonsense altogether, said Joe seriously. I do not think. Indeed, I am quite sure I shall never marry. How absurd, cried Ronald. The idea of your not marrying? It is perfectly ridiculous. The name of John Harrington was on his lips, but he checked himself. John was gone abroad, and with more than usual tact, Ronald reflected that, if Joe had really cared for the man, an allusion to him would be unkind. But Joe only shook her head, and let her cousin's words pass unanswered. She had long suspected, from Ronald's frequent allusions to Sybil, which were generally accompanied by some change of manner, that he was already in love with the fair American girl, or that he soon would be, and the acknowledgment that she had now received from himself gave her infinite pleasure. In her reflections upon her own conduct she had never blamed herself, but she had more than once thought that he was greatly to be pitied. To have married him six months ago, when she was fully conscious that she did not love him, would have been very wrong, and to have gone back at a later period, when she realized that her whole life was full of her love for John Harrington, would have been a crime. But in spite of that she was often very sorry for Ronald, and feared that she had hurt his happiness past curing. Now, therefore, when she saw how much he loved another, she was exceedingly glad, for she knew that the thing she had done had been wholly good, both for him and for her. 
They soon began to talk of other things, but the conversation fell back to the discussion of Newport, and Joe learned with some surprise that Pocock Vancouver assiduously cultivated Ronald's acquaintance, and was always ready to do anything in the world that Ronald desired. It appeared that Vancouver lent Ronald his horses at all times, and was apparently delighted when Ronald would take a mount and stay away all day. The young Englishman, of course, was not loath to accept such offers, having a radical and undisguised contempt for hired horse-flesh, and as Sybil lived several miles out of town, it was far the more pleasant plan to ride out to her, and after spending the day there, to ride back in the evening, more especially as it cost him nothing. Joe was on the point of making some remark about Vancouver, which would very likely have had the effect of cooling the intimacy between him and Ronald, but she thought better of it, and said nothing. Ronald had had no part in all the questions connected with John's election, and knew nothing of what Vancouver had done in the matter. It was better on many grounds not to stir up fresh trouble, and so long as Vancouver's stables afforded Ronald an easy and economical means of locomotion from Newport to the house of the woman he loved, the friendship that had sprung up was a positive gain. She could not understand the motives that had prompted Vancouver in the least. He had made more than one attempt to regain his position with her after the direct cut he had sustained on the evening when she parted with John, but Joe had resolutely set her face against him. Possibly she thought Vancouver might hope to regain her good opinion by a regular system of kindness to Ronald, but it hardly seemed to her as though such a result would reward him for the pains of his diplomacy. Meanwhile it would be foolish of her to interfere with any intimacy which was of real use to Ronald in his suit. As a matter of fact, Vancouver was carrying out a deliberate plan, and one which was far from ill-conceived. He had not been so blind as not to suspect Joe's secret attachment for John, when she was willing to go to such lengths in her indignation against himself for being John's enemy. But he had disposed of John, as he thought, by assisting, if not actually causing, his defeat. He imagined that Harrington had gone abroad to conceal the mortification he felt at having lost the election, and he rightly argued that for some time Joe would not bestow a glance upon any one else. In the meantime, however, he was in possession of certain details concerning Joe's fortune which could be of use, and he accordingly set about encouraging Ronald's affections in any direction they might take as long as they were not set upon his cousin. He was not surprised that Ronald should fall in love with Sybil, though he almost wished the choice could have fallen upon someone else, and accordingly he did everything in his power to make life in Newport agreeable for the young Englishman. It was convenient in some respects that the wooing should take place at so central a resort, but had the case been different, Vancouver would not have hesitated to go to Saratoga, Lennox, or Mount Desert in the prosecution of his immediate purpose, which was to help Ronald to marry any living woman rather than let him return to England a bachelor. When Ronald should be married, Joe would be in possession of three-quarters of her uncle's money, a very considerable fortune. If she was human, thought Vancouver, she would be eternally grateful to him for ridding her of her cousin, whom she evidently did not wish to marry, and for helping her thereby to so much wealth. He reflected that he had been unfortunate in the time when he had decided to be a candidate for her hand, but whatever turn affairs took, no harm was done to his own prospects by removing Ronald from the list of possible rivals. He was delighted at the preference Surbiton showed for Sybil Brandon, and in case Ronald hesitated, he reserved the knowledge he possessed of her private fortune as a final stimulus to his flagging affections. Hitherto it had not seemed necessary to acquaint his friend with the fact 
that Sybil had an income of some thirty thousand dollars yearly. Indeed, no one seemed to know it, and she was supposed to be in rather strained circumstances. As for his own chances with Joe, he had carefully hidden the tracks of his journalistic doings in the way he had once proposed to himself when Joe attacked him on the subject. A gentleman had been found upon whom he had fastened the authorship of the articles in the public estimation, and the gentleman would live and die with the reputation for writing he had thus unexpectedly obtained. He had ascertained beyond a doubt that Joe knew nothing of his interview with Bally Molly, and he felt himself in a strong position. Pocock Vancouver had for years taken an infinite amount of pains in planning and furthering his matrimonial schemes. He was fond of money, but, in a slightly less degree, he was fond of all that is beautiful and intelligent in woman, so that his efforts to obtain for himself what he considered a perfect combination of wit, good looks, and money, although ineffectual, had occupied a great deal of his spare time very agreeably. End of chapter 19